Hi, welcome to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the film series with lively discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach cinema studies at the College of Staten Island of the City University of New York. Today we continue our 10-part series, a survey of the new Latin American cinema of the past 25 years. In fact, today we'll be seeing something quite recent, Lejanía, or The Parting of the Ways, directed by Jesus Diaz from Cuba. This is a controversial film about the reunion of a family, one part of the family living in the United States, the other in Cuba. This is about the return of a mother to see her son in Cuba. We'll be talking about the social context of this film, its place within the traditions of Cuban filmmaking, and a number of other things afterwards today with two guests. We have Dan Jorgakis, who's one of the editors of Cineas magazine, and Sandra Levinson, who's the executive director of the Center for Cuban Studies. Enjoy the moving Lejanía. Talking in a number of ways. Hi. Welcome back to Cinema Then, Cinema Now. You just had an opportunity to see a, a very rich film emotionally, politically, uh, and historically. I think we have a lot to talk about in the next 30 minutes. But before we do that, I'd like to take this moment to introduce today's two guests. Sitting to my left is uh, Dan Jurgakis. Uh, Dan is known to many of you as one of the editors of Cineast magazine and also as the uh, author and editor of two of two books, The Cineast Interviews, a very important resource for those of us interested in what directors have to say about their own films, and the book In Focus, A Guide uh, to Using Films. He's interviewed a number of uh, Cuban directors, is a regular at the Havana Film Festival, and is right now working on uh, a book on the uh, Cuban director, Tomás Gutiérrez Alea, whose Memories of Underdevelopment was one of the other in fact, the only other Cuban film we've had the opportunity to show uh, in, this, uh, in this series. Uh, sitting to my right is Sandra Levinson. Uh, Sandra is, in fact, the executive director of the Center for Cuban Studies, located here in New York City. Uh, her work there takes her to Cuba about once every six weeks for a variety of uh, projects. Um, the Center for Cuban Studies, I should mention at this point, is the American distributor of a number of Cuban films, and so uh, they make available to people a number of these films at a price, of course, yes. as the phrase goes, uh, on video, on video cassette. Uh, Sandra is herself working on a book these days on the subject of divided Cuban uh, families. Um, Sandy, you would have been an appropriate guest on any number of reasons for this show, but there is this sort of nice congruence between your own particular research and this, um, and, and this film. Could you just give us a little bit of, of, um, of background about this issue of divided Cuban families? I mean, everybody knows there are divided Cuban families, but could you put it in some kind of context for us? Well, I think probably there is no other country from which people have come where the division between families is so stark. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that Cubans left Cuba in droves shortly before the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961 was the first big break. Right. And that was mainly of upper class and middle class people very much tied to the United States in terms of business, their work, their education. Um, and as the waves of immigrants have come over the years, the, the socioeconomic background of the people has also changed. So that with the most recent wave, which was Marielle in 1980, right. we got large numbers of people who were described, at least by the U.S. press, as lower class. The right, Cubans right. would never have described them in that way. 
Um, but the fact is that what we see in this movie, in Lehania, is part of an ongoing problem, a problem which has been very, very, very sad right. for a lot of Cuban families. And what has been so interesting for me, and one of the reasons that I wanted to do research on this subject, is that you don't just have a division of families. You have these families are divided by their politics and by their passions about politics yes, and by their relationship to the society. So in one way, I was using my families as stand-ins for the two societies, for the United States and for Cuba. And that's one of the reasons I liked this movie so much. It was the first movie <coughs> made by the Cubans on this subject. Right. Okay. The very first. Okay. You know, which, which except for a documentary, which the same filmmaker made some years before, called 55 Brothers and Sisters, which was a documentary made that followed a number of children of Cuban immigrants who went back to Cuba as part of the Antonio Maceo Brigade and their meeting Cuba, in a sense, for the uh -huh. first time as teenagers, um, people in their, in their 20s, going back sometimes to their old homes, going back to see an old aunt, an uncle, um, and it was a very touching film, and so clearly Jesus Diaz had an interest in that subject for some time. Well, I, I want to talk about Jesus in just a second, but why do you think it is that this, it's taken a while for this subject to be handled in this, uh, and it, since this is the first time it, it, it's handled, this is just sort of a cooling off period for all parties in certain... Um, it's a subject that caused a lot of conflict in Cuba, um, a subject that uh, people, different people felt very differently about. Right. Um, some people um, will always refer to the Cuban exiles as gusanos, as worms, right. as traitors. Um, others were very excited and happy and pleased when the dialogue between the Cuban community in the United States and the Cuban government began in 1977. and forever after will call the Cubans in this country and the Cubans outside of Cuba not worms and not traitors but the Cuban community abroad. Okay. So it was part of, it came out of that new way of looking at Cubans abroad. Yeah, uh, okay. Okay, that, that sort of takes us to the director hi himself. Dan, you've had an opportunity to interview Jesus Diaz, as I understand it. Could you tell us a little bit about him and where this film comes in his career in the context of also of, of Cuban filmmaking. Who's, who's Diaz? Uh, who is this guy? Anyway. Well, like most uh, Cuban directors, he began making uh, documentaries, which is different than the American system, where if you're documentary, you're documentary, and if you're fiction, you're fiction. In Cuba, they tend to make documentaries first and let you learn your uh, ABCs, and then you move uh, to fiction right. film, and that, that's what he did. I don't know if that's a particularly good system, but that's the system that they have. Uh, on, well, like many of the directors, he's an intellectual. Right. He was very concerned with, with doing a meaty film that had something to say. Uh, the first time I talked to him about this, it was kind of, oh, over drinks and so forth. And I said, well, are you willing to put this in print, what you just told me, over drinks? He said, yeah, of course. And so um, we got together and he said there were four major responses to this film. The first one, by far the largest, was people say, oh boy, it's finally out in the open, we're talking about it. You know, half of us are living in Florida and New Jersey, and uh, there are brothers and sisters and uncles, and the families are divided, and we've got to talk about it. Then there was another group of people who said, oh, the film is lousy. When she gave them all those uh, things, anybody would have taken them. Nobody's going to turn that <laughs> down. Who's going to believe this or this guy for some abstract ideology is going to turn down a washing machine? I mean, it wasn't a washing machine. Or others said, well, the people who took the gifts were treated too cruelly, too, too much of a caricature that, well, well of course, uh, if you didn't have these things and somebody allows you to have a vacuum cleaner, why wouldn't you take it? Right. Uh, it doesn't make you a bad person and it doesn't make you a silly person. Uh, then there was another group, a smaller group, and this is it's very strange to me, who said you shouldn't talk about motherhood and that it's not oh. a fit subject to discuss a male and his mother and how they're negotiating the fact that why had she abandoned him and, and these things and these things just shouldn't be touched on, period. And then there was a small group uh, within the, with some power within the party uh, especially, who felt that this subject was still too hot and that they should just be condemned, the people who'd gone away, and that he was much too friendly um, to the people who'd come back, and that it, it was just better not to have this happen at all. Well, what, when the film came out, um, this last group must have had some influence because no major media reviewed the film, which was very unusual in Cuba. 
But also the complexity of Cuba, the film was shown. A lot of students went to see it. Small country, uh, the film clubs called him at his home and said, we'd like you to come out and discuss the film. So he said almost every night he would go to one university center or worker center to discuss the film and eventually was reviewed in, in the student magazines and worker publications even and it became a quote profitable film and a, and a highly seen film in Cuba even though there were these elements within the government that didn't like it. But even at the film festival that year, they, uh, the official entry, right. this reminds me of a lot of countries by the mm -hmm. way, the official entry was another film which I frankly didn't care for at all, I thought was quite inferior, didn't win anything. His was an unofficial entry and the international film critics Gave, the prize. gave him the prize, <laughs> just as the Cuban uh, Student Association had given him a prize. And that year in several foreign uh, festivals where he was not the official Cuban entry but simply an entry, uh, he also won prizes. So I thought that was a complicated way of, of how that film was received. And I think it's, it's what Sandy was saying. It's a, it's a very difficult topic for Cubans to deal with. Uh, now, if you had, had a chance to mention this film, I don't know if you have at all, to any other filmmakers themselves, I mean, it, what's the opinion among filmmakers, if at all, in, in, in Cuba? They generally tend not to speak too much about each other's film because I think there's always this, they're, they're afraid you're going to take it as some, if it's a criticism, then, oh, they're fighting. And if it's, a, if it's a complimentary, well, they just scratch each other's back. So they generally don't yeah. speak too, uh, too seriously about each other's work. They'd rather just talk about their own work or their, or their future plans. Yeah, that's, you know, no, please go on, Sam. No, I was just going to say that the, um, the, the Cine Cubano, the Cuban film magazine did right, write about Lejanilla, right. did publish photos from it and so forth. Right. Uh, and I think it was, the film was very much appreciated, very much appreciated. It just yeah. wasn't talked about publicly in the same way that um, the usual Cuban film is. It was, I was very surprised in a way that it, um, it dealt um, so sharply with some of these questions. It was very upfront, a very upfront movie, and in a way, there was something in it for all of these groups and the way they well, responded or didn't <laughs> respond to the movie. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Th no, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a film that has this realist look about it. I mean, so much of the action takes place within the apartment, uh, with, within the apartment itself, and yet um, uh, there's a way in which, without it becoming any kind of simple allegory, uh, you, you, you understand that everybody is playing multiple roles in this uh, in this right. film, and every incident is going to be viewed by uh, different family members in very different ways. And the film, to me, foregrounds that for us. I mean, how many yeah. points of view are operating within this little confined, uh, this little confined space? Sure, and I, I mean, I think you see, you see uh, how difficult it is for the son's wife in that kind of situation, because you have not only the normal difficulty of meeting your mother-in-law for the first time, but my God, she's a gusana. Right. You know, she's a, in some way a political traitor to the country. And she's also hurt your husband. And so yes. you see both of these operating, and as you see in any Cuban family. I mean, the fact is almost every Cuban family is divided in this way. And almost every Cuban family has those same conflicts. There are people who want the goodies. There are people who will reject the goodies. There are people who feel the hurt and the pain, and there are people who simply forget about the members of the family who left. And I think the movie was very, very good in that way, that it showed a little bit of everything, and yet the people were not caricatures. Oh, they no, were very yeah. definite people with their own, um, with their yeah. own problems and conflicts. I think right. the only exception to that are the, the uh, relatives who accept the goods yeah. and sort of are yeah. all lot consumers. And I even asked him, I said, well, did you purposely kind of <laughs> you know, have some fun with these people. He said, no, he didn't. He, he <laughs> didn't mean to make them so gross, if you will. I mean, he, he was, uh, at least that's what he says in public, that, that that just came out that way, but he didn't particularly want them to, to be caricatures But I know either. people like that in Cuba. I know people like that in, in some Brooklyn. Way, in some <laughs> 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 you, know, you know them everywhere. Caricature. <laughs> They're caricatures of themselves. Right. Well, the other, the, the thing that interested me about them was also the fact that they are players within the society. That is, right. when the son talks to the uncle. I mean, the, the, the uncle is, is, not, is not at the lowest rung of workers right. within the society. And then he says, well, wait a minute. I know the game you're playing. You have learned that there's a way in which any system can be corrupted. 
and that you're taking full advantage of this. You're riding around in this car. Uh, you're making these kinds of deals that aren't really, r really within the in the rules. So, uh, yes, it's <laughs> the, the interesting thing about about those relatives, not to make them particularly complicated, is that they would be the same in any society. I would venture even that maybe some of the opposition of the film was that there was a, there was actually a, a cook up between, I mean, <laughs> there are special stores and, and that some Cubans go to, some can't do, so perhaps there was a little innuendo there that, but the same people that do that are probably the ones who would take all these gifts if they had a chance well, at them. I mean, it isn't said that way, but it, there's, a, there's a hint there that this kind of mentality exists, so it's not just uh, the pure revolutionary zeal, which actually well, his wife had. And also, of the two people who come back, uh, the younger uh, yeah. is... Uh, also has this uh, suspended soul. The Greeks call it a suspended soul, where you, you're not quite an American and you're not quite a Cuban anymore, right. and you just love being in Havana, but you can't wait to get back to New York. And in New York, you can pine for Havana. Right. And I think, in some ways, she's the, 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 really the most interesting of all the characters in the film. Oh, the, the, the cousin from yeah, the, the cousin, cousin from New York. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I, I agree. And I also find the, the portrayal of women in the film very interesting, uh, because th those those are the two women who really never get to know each other. And yet we, as, as spectators, get to hear both of their stories and see them in, in this interaction. The well, paradox, the no, paradox no, of, of Cuban film is they're very sensitive to women's issues, yet mm -hmm. they still don't have women directors uh, uh, of any, uh, in any great number, uh, w which is strange. I mean, right. it's, it's, it is a paradox. I didn't mean to. No, well, also, I think that um, I wanted to say something just about the, the opportunists shown. Yeah. Um, Lehania was also made at a time when that became a popular sub-theme in a number of Cuban movies to talk about the opportunistic bureaucrats okay. and to portray them in perhaps a kind of cardboard way, but to portray real behavior, uh, yeah. real behavior. Um, about the women, I, I think that um, when we were talking before, we, we were talking about all of the kinds of things that, that Diaz is saying in the movie, you know. And for me, the heart of the movie is when the character that Isabel Santos plays, the cousin, uh, quotes the poem of Lourdes Casal, yes. who was a Cuban exile. Lourdes was a person very important in the director's own life. And Lourdes Casal was a, a Cuban exile um, who left as a young Catholic, anti-communist, came to this country as a black woman began to feel all of the oppressions that a black woman feels in the society, changed her opinion radically about the Cuban Revolution, began to travel back, became a person who wrote a great deal about Cuba, um, died several years ago quite young of a, of a kidney disease. And when Isabel Santos quotes Lourdes's poem about being too much of a New Yorker to ever again be a Cuban and too Cuban to ever really be a New Yorker, for me, that was the heart of the movie. That was the sadness of the movie. That's the, the tragedy of the split families and, and really of the families outside. The families inside Cuba are not tragic. Yes. In my own research, mm -hmm. I found that. It was the people outside who are bitter, who are angry, who are frustrated, who are sad. The people inside are very often sad because their families are outside, but they don't suffer this loss of identity, This the sense of homesickness which right. Cubans suffer well, from. What, you know, it's interesting about that. We talk about the divisions in Cuba. How about the divisions in Miami? They wanted to bring this film to Miami, and a large segment of the Miami Cuban public said, yes, let, we want to see this. And others are saying, no, never. It's a Cuban film. It's a Cuban pers It's a Castro film. It's a Castro perspective. <laughs> right. So you have that same division on the other side as you do uh, on, the, on the Havana side. Well, that, that division is, of course, in the film itself because we do see the moment in which the daughter-in-law offers to the mother. She says, oh, it's a Cuban film. And as, and as uh, I, I think so, a number of our viewers would have recognized, it's an extremely famous Cuban film. It's right. Tomas Godier right. Azalea's right. the, last, uh, the Last Supper. And she immediately says, no. Okay, whereas one can ease, w one knows that the cousin, while living in New York, is conversant in both cultures. I mean, she would be the person to be found at the repertory house, seeing the double bell, of, double bill of Lucia and Memories of Underdevelopment, or uh, or, or wherever. Whereas the mother would be watching a game show on television? <laughs> this film has done well in the cassette stores in Miami, I understand, because you watch a cassette in your house. 
Right. You don't have to go out and be seen attending. And in that sense, I think it, it functions in the U.S. the way El Super functions in Cuba. El Super, which was made in New York, is probably the most popular or the most admired of the American-made Cuban films that you see it in Cuba, but you won't usually see it at, at a formal setting, but you'll see somebody's got a cassette of it and they'll be showing it in their house. For much the same reason that, that there are, you can't expose yourself in public to all that baloney, if you will, right. whereas you can just watch it at home and talk about it with your friends and, and, and go on with your life. I think something else, we sometimes focus too hard on, the, on, on, on when it's a country like Cuba, like these divided families. So many immigrant families have this problem also. I'm very close in the Greek community. And you have the Greek who comes to America to, to go to school, and then he marries. And then after a while, you know, he just pines like mad for Greece. Uh, but some, the same sort of thing happens. It hasn't had a political dimension to it. Although during but the, the political was very <laughs> important in the Cuban. Yeah. I mean, here you no. have these two governments at loggerheads taking advantage of the communities. But I, you know? what I'm saying is I think it allows the, the film more universality than it's, it's mm -hmm. yes, it's about Cuba, yes. but it's also about this people who go away and create a diaspora somewhere and then come back and you can't go home again, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I think, I, I think we have to see it both in terms of the specific politics of the Cuban situation, but I think that's right, that virtually anybody who comes from a culture of exile uh, can find a lot of the human issues in this film are very much uh, are very much the same the same thing. Uh, no, I was going to say it's also people who see the film may say, oh well, this they're too idealistic or they think about ideas too much. I think that is a difference. That is yeah. not exaggerated. That is not a caricature. People do talk and think like that. Uh, and just as on the one level wanting some material goods is certainly perfectly understandable, I think it's harder for Americans to believe these people really have these kind of principles that they, that they, they think about and are really, because we're so consumer oriented, we're so product market oriented, the idea that other people might be idea oriented uh, is, a, is a little hard to grasp and say, oh, well, that's, that's just propaganda. But no, that's how people are. And yet are. people, that's real, how people, people are. realize yeah. that when they go there, I think it's one yeah. of the, you know, for people who travel to Cuba a lot, as I do, I mean, that's, that's not any longer a question. But I remember the first time I went to Cuba. Right. And I remember that one of the reasons I liked it so much was because I felt that there were people there consumed by ideas. It had been a long time since I had been in a society or around a group of people where people could get passionate about ideas right. and about values. And I think that is one of the attractive things about Cuba to this day. People fight about values. And well, it's very exciting. And of course, that's again, that's something that is in the film. Not only mm -hmm. do they talk about it, but that's, that's part of the, the conflict. The mother is a little bit amazed at the fact that the son is pursuing yes. studies in a certain way. And what's happened is that through what, what is clearly exposed in the film is a very difficult personal process for him. There's nothing, something that he's still in some sense wanting to forget about himself, yep. that he has through a number of years even changed and has been reshaped into someone who now passionately cares about things. It's interesting to me that the film chooses not to define that in dogmatic political terms. It defines it in no. terms, it, it defines it in terms of the fact that now education and what it can offer mm -hmm. is of significant value to him. And there's, for example, the conflict when he says, well, what about my sister? Is she gone to school? And he says, oh, well, no, 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 you know, sure. She was never very good at school. And, and as we learn later, well, apparently he was never all that good right. at, sco <laughs> at, at, at school. And this is something that's come much later in life. He's almost made to seem as though he was a bit of a delinquent. Oh, oh I, 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 I don't, th I think we don't have to say a, 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 a bit of it. And it's not, uh, you know, uh, the daughter-in-law is the one who's saying, you abandon him, you abandon right. him. But, right. but it's not clear that the whole film endorses uh, that, that yes, we have to consider that as one of the options. But when the mother herself says, you don't understand, I didn't have a choice, I had to leave. Um, you, uh, well, as we learn more about her personality, there's one can understand that's how she would right. have had to had to feel. Uh, quite different from the cousin, whose feelings are much more complicated about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and divided about uh, about this. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about those gifts again. You know, I uh, you meet people in Cuba and in the street, and you start talking to them. After they get to know you, and they feel good about it, they say, "Gee, you know." Uh, I, I want to send something, and they want to send something to New Jersey or something, and they give it to you to take. And it's usually a very trivial matter. I mean, it's not contraband in the usual. They just don't trust the mails. 
and they, and they say, if you come back, you know, my daughter's shoe size, and she, they need a particular shoe size and style, and it's not an expensive item. It's just an item that, who, which is not available for one reason or another, and so they, they'd like to have that, but so they'd say, you know, I'm not against the revolution. I just want my daughter to have these pink shoes with the little ribbons right, right, right. and so forth on them, you know, and that's very human, and in one sense, maybe the film didn't quite catch that part of it. Uh, you know, Cuba is a is a society. I think there was a reason, though, for that. Yeah. Dan. Um, what they were, what Diaz was showing, was the first wave That's of true. people coming back, yeah. and I think what we're experiencing now is the relaxation. You know, okay, the relatives come back, they've brought things. It's not so terrible to ask a friend to bring something. But this was, she came back in the first wave. That's what this was supposed to represent. You've got the dates in the movie, and mm -hmm. it's clear that this was the first group of people. I mean, she came without any warning. I mean, that doesn't happen now. Right. I mean, she right. suddenly appeared because the dialogue between right. the Cuban exiles and the government had just taken place, and this was the first time when the Cuban exiles could start coming back. So I think that that's part of the reason why you don't get the kind of subtlety or the more natural way of, of dealing with gifts that you get now after it's been 10 years that they've been coming back. Well, I guess what I was re reacting to is the average American might say, oh, gee, they don't have anything there, so whatever you bring, they're just, you know, bring a <laughs> razor <laughs> blade or, or bars. They've got a lot. They've got all the basics, and we're really mainly talking about luxury goods, and that's one thing to be understood. And when you're thinking about a city like Havana, and you say, well, how, how does Havana stack up against uh, New York or Philadelphia? Well, you can say there's no homeless there. Uh, but beyond that, I think the real comparison is how does it stack up against San Juan or how does it stack up against Mexico City? Right. And if you look at it that way, then Havana's affluent. And, so, uh, you right. know, and, and I think that's important to keep that in mind, even though we're talking about these gifts. Because now we're talking about the luxury goods. You know, we're talking about the video cassettes and that, that little thing that makes you different. We're not talking about basics. Well, we're also talking about the fact that and Cubans always related to people from the United yes. States. Right, yes. The, the, I, the identification was not with Mexico. It was not with Latin. I mean, that's a, that's a later thing. It's almost something that's come with the revolution, the identity between Cuba and the third world, between Cuba and the rest of Latin America, between Cuba and Central America. We were the ones mm -hmm. that the Cubans related to. Well, you know, it, it, we have to bring up a, a famous uh, aspect of American popular culture, and of course it's a story that uh, CBS originally was quite worried about the fact of, of Lucy and Ricky being a Cuban. No, but no, but, 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 the, but, the, but the interesting point is that even 30 years ago, that was so much an accepted kind of issue that Cuba and America, you know, it's 90 miles away, et cetera, that uh, initially the show was accepted upon exactly those premises yeah. without sort of without sort of a blink. So, I mean, so right. <laughs> we don't think of it. I mean, we, you know, we <laughs> think of this in the history of situation comedies, but it's a very interesting window on what a certain kind of relationship was 30 to 35, uh, 35 years ago. Um, completely I, bound, especially in terms of popular culture. Completely. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Don't talk about jazz and Dizzy Gillespie and no, all that. I'm here about going to do a movie about that soon. <laughs> and also in terms of the revolution, I mean, Jose Marti and, and the cigar workers in Tampa were the uh, yeah. the, <laughs> the the founders of the Cuban Revolution. Now we're talking another century. So the connections are very profound and. Uh, Long-standing. I want to talk just for a minute. Uh, to ask you a couple of questions about some other connections. Okay. Because the no, no the, the film that we that uh, we showed the week before this one is a very famous landmark film, Memories of Underdevelopment, by the director who's <laughs> the, uh, Thomas Gutierrez Le. You're working you're working on the book. These films as films, uh, they certainly come from different moments in the social history of Cuba. I mean, they're almost 20 years apart in film right. uh, in, in, in filmmaking. What about them as fil as filmmaking? Uh, uh, this film strikes me as as obviously accomplished. I mean, the nuances of acting, but it's a much more conservative looking and feeling film than the than than the Alea of. Two, uh, thing, two okay. things come to mind. One, uh, not quite on your question. I'll come back to it in a second. About the major character in the U.S., so often we cannot divorce the characters in the film from their creators. And one of the things that Leia has always uh, been unhappy about is that the major character in Memories of Underdeveloped is assumed to be him. No. And uh, Diaz is also concerned that we must, this guy must be him. The author is speaking when this young man, not necessarily so. It's, right. it's okay. working fiction. And it's, that's very important because there's a tendency of American critics to do that. In fact, there was quite a 
uh, a ripple effect about that when, when memories first came. I said, well, Leo's about to defect. And there were a lot of articles about that. Well, he's, you know, he's, he's still there. He's been, he's been in America many, many times since then and so forth. Uh, in terms of making, I think it's true that in the earlier period, they were, first of all, they didn't have the equipment, and they were very open to experimentation and chance and what have you. And some of the films they made were magnificent. They also had a lot of problems with films that aren't so magnificent, right. and they've slowly put together a film industry. So you have more scripting, uh, better camera work, etc. And so I think you see that fruition in this particular film where there is less experimentation. They're also creating a national industry. Before the Cuban Revolution, the only films that you saw in Havana in Spanish were made in Mexico and Argentina right. and so forth. And even those were always underplayed to the American films, which had all the mass audience. So one of the uh, messages uh, or one of the uh, mandates of the Cuban Film Institute is to create a national cinema that people actually liked. And what you have now in Cuba is, in fact, Cuban films can go neck to neck or head to head with, with Hollywood films and do just as well or even better. Some of them do better, some right. of them do worse, but many of them do better or just as well. And this film is in that direction. So part of that is pulling back also because the, the idea was stuff. was this con conflictual right. idea. It, it, um, it's almost as though if you're going to yeah. talk about such a an idea like this, you'd better have a film that's accessible in terms of its style. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. those uh, those socialist uh, sitcoms that, that that they've made now, which are could be American in terms of their their they're really sitcoms, except they have socialist problems like right. now, you know the taxi cab doesn't work and this doesn't work, and that too is a movement in that popular direction. Um, which perhaps in the long run will have its own technical, um, as opposed to the heroic moment, which I think memories represents the heroic moment of sort of really doing it all from shoestrings and guts and, and okay. wild imagination. I don't know whether our heroic moment has come or passed, but our <laughs> moment for the show is, 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 is about to pass. If you would like more information about cinema then, cinema now, or about cinema studies, graduate or undergraduate, drop us a line. Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Let me give you that information again, okay? Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Well, Dan, it was a pleasure having you here. Thanks for bringing your expertise about a man you've met and interviewed and all of that. Sandra, it was a wonderful coincidence uh, <laughs> about your research as well as your general knowledge about Cuban culture and this film. A pleasure having you here. Thank you. Okay. Well, as always, I hope that our thought and discussion here leads you to thought and discussion at home that you enjoy. Thanks for joining us.